Amy, do I call you? Do I call you Professor Elman? Yeah. Whatever you want to call me, Professor. Okay. Elman. All right. All right. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We'll just wait another minute before we start. Okay, I think whenever you're ready, Amy, you can go ahead. Okay. Let me just wait for the my phone, excuse me, to just conclude and then I'll begin. Okay. Go ahead. Go Greetings, ahead. everyone. Um, this is our series on the intersectionality of anti-Semitism. Uh, given the global pervasiveness of anti-Semitism, its online presence and related inroads into the mainstream, we at ISGAP believe that there may be no greater challenge for scholars of anti-Semitism than to reconsider our assumptions about who anti-Semites are, where and how they mobilize. This series of seminars interrogates the identities anti-Semites presumably possess, the ideological positions they prefer, and the places that they inhabit. With an eye toward anti-Semitism's ideological fluidity, as well as its contradictions and corresponding convergences, we've been interested in original interesting and emerging areas of anti-Semitism research. And to this end, we invited researchers to present work on a range of topics that include, but aren't necessarily exclusive to, racism, heterosexism, and misogyny. We are so pleased to have this particular series on intersectionality conclude with Professor Claff's lecture entitled the intersection of anti-Semitism and misogyny in the United Kingdom. Professor Clath is a senior lecturer in law at the Helena Kennedy Center for International Justice, Sheffield Hallam University. She's also a professor affiliate at the University of Haifa and an editor in chief of the Journal of Contemporary Anti-Semitism. She serves on the advisory board of the Louis Steed Brandeis Center for Human Rights Under Law and is, mem is a member of the United Kingdom Lawyers for Israel, a charitable organization that uses the law to oppose attempts to delegitimize Israel and attack Israel and its supporters. She's published on a very wide range of issues relating to contemporary anti-Semitism. I believe her Fathom article on Holocaust inversion remains one of the most important contributions to our understanding of contemporary anti-Semitism. More recently, she's currently involved in a collaborative research project to examine the harms caused by online hate speech directed specifically at Jewish and Muslim women. She's also serving as an expert witness on the topic of anti-Semitism in a disciplinary case before the General Teaching Council of Scotland and in a case at present before the Human Rights Tribunal of Ontario on behalf of the International Legal Forum. In 2018, she was named the Algeminer, by the Algeminer as one of the top 100 people positively influencing Jewish life. Leslie, we're delighted to have you with us today. My friend and colleague, Leslie Claff, will be speaking for about half an hour and will have at least 20 minutes to take your questions and comments after her lecture. I extend the floor to you now. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, Amy, for that very, very generous introduction. Um, I'm delighted to be uh, to have been invited to give this talk on uh, aspects of intersectionality and anti-Semitism. I think it's been an excellent uh, series of lectures, and I think we should extend our gratitude to Professor Elman, Amy, for organising uh, this series. So I'm going to talk, as Amy said, I'm going to talk for about 30 to 35 minutes on the topic of intersection, the intersection of anti-Semitism and misogyny in the UK. And um, 
Um, Daphne, can you just move on to the next slide, please? Uh, thanks. I, I'm uh, using some slides and the material I'm going to be covering uh, is taken from a chapter uh, I wrote on this topic uh, that was published in a book last summer. Uh, it's edited by Irene Zempi and Joe Smith, um, and it's called Misogyny as Hate Crime. Um, so if you find what I have to say today interesting, uh, you can find the chapter online. Uh, there is an ebook uh, and read further on it. Uh, next slide, please. So the outline of the talk, uh, I'm going to talk briefly uh, about intersectionality, make sure we understand what the concept of intersectionality is. Then we're going to make sure we understand what, what gendered antisemitism is. Uh, we're going to look very briefly at the history of gendered anti-Semitism uh, and then look at some contemporary examples of gendered anti-Semitism in the United Kingdom, both online and offline. Next slide, please. Um, so, so before we start, we have to make sure we understand what we mean by intersectionality. Uh, and this is because the concept of intersectionality has been politically abused by numerous um, fe social, uh, feminist social movements and anti-racist social movements. To exclude uh, Jews and anti-Semitism uh, and Israel from the intersectionality framework. And um, this point was made very forcefully by Professor Karen Stogner, who's a Professor of Sociology at Passau University in Germany in a webinar she gave very recently um, uh, at the Institute for the Study of Contemporary Antisemitism, the University of Indiana. And she's written quite a lot on this uh, and uh, I would recommend that you read it. But basically um, intersectional, so intersectional theory has become synonymous with, in our minds, in most people's minds, with anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism, but actually the core meaning of intersectional theory uh, is simply this, that the theory recognizes that people are often disadvantaged by multiple sources of discrimination related to their different identities their different minority identities, such as race, religion, sex, sexual orientation, disability, and transgender identity. And this theory burst onto the academic scene uh, in 1989 um, via uh, an academic lawyer uh, at a university in America, I can't remember which one, I think it may, have, may be Michigan, um, Kimberly Crenshaw, who is a woman of color, uh, and who uh, experienced um, uh, multiple victimizations because of her minority racial status and her the fact that she was a woman. Um, more, more recent uh, research uh, in the UK by two colleagues um, at um, Nottingham University, Nottingham Trent University, uh, Louise Mullaney and Loretta Trickett, two academic lawyers, uh, produced this report, Misogyny Hate Crime Evaluation Report in 2018. And they looked at women from Black, Asian and minority ethnic groups and found that these women often experienced misogyny, hate crime and racial hate crime simultaneously and feel doubly vulnerable to attack. Um, just to say that this research and this subsequent report did not include Jewish women, which is unfortunate. Um, it just looked at the so-called BAME community, Black, Asian, minority, ethnic. But Jewish Jews in the UK are legally classed as a racial and ethnic minority, as well as a religious minority. And so it's somewhat unfortunate that um, these researchers didn't consider uh, the Jewish woman's experience of double victimization. Um, Amnesty International produced a report called Toxic Twitter about um, intersectional abuse directed at women on Twitter 
Uh, and uh, they, what they found was that uh, minority women, whether they are minority because of their race, their religion, their sexual orientation, their, their gender status or whatever, um, experienced a kind of harm that was compounded um, and which was unique in the sense that the quality of the abuse changed somehow through its combined uh, through the intersectionality, the combination of two sources of discrimination or victimization created um, a different kind of abuse. Um, and, and so that was interesting. Uh, can we have the next slide, please, Daphne? So um, gendered anti-Semitism is the term uh, that we use to refer to the abuse that occurs at the intersection of anti-Semitism and misogyny. I've explained that in, in the chapter in that book. Um, and it's very important that we do look at gendered anti-Semitism, that we do do some research on it in the United Kingdom. There is very little empirical or sociological data on gendered anti-Semitism. And it's obviously very important because from the research that we've just mentioned on the previous slide, um, we know that women's experience of abuse differs according to their different intersection, uh, intersectional identities. But very little actually is known about the abuse experienced uh, by Jewish women. The SARA Conference Against Antisemitism and Misogyny in 2018, which was the first uh, event specifically devoted to addressing gendered antisemitism, and it followed on from the um, sudden awareness of gendered antisemitism as a result of a public debate that ensued um, because of the anti-Semitism in Corbyn's Labour Party and the voicing by Jewish uh, female parliamentarians about who, who spoke out about the anti-Semitism, about the abuse they experienced. As a result of that, the SARA conference took place uh, in 2018, and it noted that both anti-Semitism and sexism involved notions of power control and domination, and that Jewish women are at the intersection of both. So I think that that's um, a very interesting observation. This was reported by the Antisemitism Policy Trust in a 2019 publication. Uh, can we have the next slide, please, Daphne? Um, despite the you know, the importance of, of gendered antisemitism. In fact, there's been very little research done on it. Um, and um, the SARA conference noted that the only research really uh, to date on gendered antisemitism is largely focused on the Jap stereotype, the Jewish American princess stereotype, or Jewish princess, uh, as we sometimes refer to it. Um, and it was noted at the SARA conference that the Jap stereotype um, is the perfect combination of anti-Semitism and misogyny. Um, it remodels traditional anti-Semitic tropes into a female form. She is materialistic, money-grabbing, manipulative, shallow, crafty, and ostentatious. Um, a feminist in America named Evelyn Chorton Brock has said about the Jap stereotype, she has referred to it as, quote, an insult, an injury, a violence done to Jewish women. Um, it's, she said it's the perfect combination of racism, anti-Semitism and misogyny, and yet it is socially acceptable. Uh, we see that the Jap stereotype has been um, uh, exploited by the media, in film, in television. Um, it's been uh, portrayed by Jewish writers like Philip Roth in Goodbye Columbus and Herman Woke in Marjorie Morningstar. Um, and 
it's considered, you know, it's considered cute. Um, it, it's 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 socially acceptable, uh, and we could actually hold, you know, a webinar just just looking at, at, at the Jap stereotype. Um, it could be um, it could be acceptable because it is used in uh, in Jewish communities. Uh, Jewish women sometimes say it about themselves. Um, and also it could be that because it reflects society's structural sexism, um, it has it has been socially accepted. Um, other than the Jap stereotype, there has been limited empirical work done on the experiences of Jewish women in the Shoah. Uh, British writer Agnes Grunwald Spear in 2018 published a book called um, women's voices in the, Holo in the Holocaust, and she actually interviewed uh, uh, women survivors of the Shoah. Um, uh, and what she reported was that um, the the experience of women at the hands of the Nazis was very different from that of, of Jewish men uh, at the hands of the Nazis, and in many ways were much worse. So, for example. Jewish women were disproportionately chosen for death in the camps simply to stop Jews from breeding. Um, and um, so, you know, that, that is a very interesting uh, piece of work. But other than that, certainly in the UK context, um, there has been very little, uh, precious little uh, attention given to looking at the agendered anti Semitism and researching it. Uh, can we have the next slide, please, Stephanie? Um, so if we think about the possible reasons for the lack of attention given to gendered anti-Semitism, um, Professor Karen Stogner uh, has done a lot of work on this, and she blames uh, intersectional theory pretty much for excluding uh, anti-Semitism um, from its framework. Uh, she says that anti uh, intersectional theory relies on binary markers such as black, white, male, female, hetero, lesbian, gay, and anti-Semitic theory places Jews beyond binary classification. So we know that Jews have been thought of as, uh, thought of as not white by the far right, but were thought of as uber white and privileged by the hard left. Um, Jews, uh, the sexuality and the gender of Jews has been characterized as ambiguous by anti-Semitic theory in terms of class, um, Jews are placed both, you know, as, uh, as, as being um, involved in communism and creators of communism and, and proletariat and as being the capitalist and bourgeoisie. So because of the way that anti-Semitism has portrayed Jews, it hasn't fit uh, clearly within the binary markers preferred by intersectional theory. Um, Professor Stogner has also pointed out, and this is something we alluded to right at the beginning of the session, is that the vehement anti-Zionist orientation of some feminist anti-racist social movements contributes to the exclusion of anti-Semitism anti from the intersectionality framework. And in fact, intersectional theory, even uh, she, she shows, uh, serves as a backdrop or a framework for Israel hatred and anti-Zionism. And of course, it could also be the case that anti-Semitism scholars have lacked a general interest in women and their experiences. That's also another possible reason. Uh, can we have the next slide, please, Daphne? Um, so we're going to look now at some contemporary uh, uh, gendered anti-Semitism in the UK. First of all, some online examples. Um, these, this experience of gendered anti-Semitism online um, came to the fore when, uh, when the House of Commons held its first public debate on anti-Semitism in the Labour Party in April 2018, and Jewish female parliamentarians who were at that time members of the Labour Party voiced their experiences. Um, the um, 
the uh, examples of online and uh, gendered anti-Semitism that I'm going to show you are all uh, from uh, from parliamentarians, and there are there are examples um, um, experienced by journalists and uh, actresses and um, other celebrities. Um, but we mustn't we mustn't think that online gendered anti-Semitism is only experienced by women in the public eye. Um, it is also experienced by women that nobody's ever heard of, by people who aren't celebrities. It's just that there's no data on it. We don't know about it because it's not been researched and there's no data on it. But the, the evidence that we do have comes from parliamentarians and so on. So if we look at this first uh, example, um, a couple of SHIT stirring CUM, I don't want to offend anyone, so I won't say the words in four buckets, bought and paid for by Israel. This was um, a, a social media abuse. Uh, it was on Twitter. It was directed at two Labour Party members, Ruth Smith and Dame Margaret Hodge, because they raised concerns about anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. Um, we can see, uh, and it was it was uh, uh, by it was it was signed by a, or from a um, a Labour Party member. Um, we can see that where the misogyny is, um, a CUM bucket is a synonym and uh, uh, it's a slur for uh, a slut uh, or a whore. And um, in terms of the anti Semitism, uh, that resides in the suggestion that um, not only were these women traitors to the Labour Party because they um, complained about anti Semitism in the Labour Party and disparaged the Labour Party, but also in the suggestion that they were paid for by a foreign power. Therefore, they're traitors to the country. They were paid for by a foreign power, Israel, which in hard left thinking is the great whore master of the world. Um, the hard left in this country see the hand of Israel behind everything uh, that they don't like. Um, and so it seems that in this example of um, gendered anti-Semitism, the sexual violence and the obscenity is actually triggered by the anti-Semitism. These women are whores because they are paid for by Israel. Um, and this triggers the uh, violent, uh, misogynistic rhetoric. Um, can we just go to the next slide, uh, Daphne, please, just to make a point. So um, David Hirsch, Professor da uh, Dr. David Hirsch, who, who's the director of the new London Centre for the Study of Contemporary Antisemitism, observed in 2019, in relation to some of these uh, examples, that the expression of sexual violence against women becomes far worse when an element of conscious anti-Semitism enters into it. And I think if we look at that particular example, if we go back to that, uh, Daphne, uh, back to the previous slide, I think, I think that's, that's accurate, just, just based on this example. Had the abuser said, um, had, had the abuser referred to um, Dame Margaret Hodge and uh, Ruth Smith as Blairite CUM buckets, um, that wouldn't have had the same impact because the logic of the connection uh, between being a follower or supporter of Tony Blair and a whore isn't there. Um, so it seems that the anti-Semitism here and the, and the violence the violent rhetoric and the misogynistic abuse, the obscenity are all interlinked, but are triggered by the anti-Semitism. Um, the second example, this was directed at uh, Ruth Smith. The gallows would be a fine and fitting place for this dyke piece of yeard SHIT to swing from. 
Um, so here, um, the word, the use of the word dyke is quite interesting because it could be used in its original sense to be a homophobic or misogynistic slur. Uh, but on the other hand, it could be used in an anti-Semitic sense because in the late 19th and early 20th century, uh, Jewish women were masculinized. Mas and uh, so it could be used in that sense. It's very clear uh, that uh, referring to someone as a Yid and adding the word S-H-I-T um, is, is anti-Semitic. We have... Uh, we have... Um, a kind of death threat here, it's very violent language. Uh, swinging from the gallows would be a fine and fitting place. Um, and there's a, there's a likening of, of Ruth Smith to the criminal who was hanged uh, for the crime. And presumably the crime here is the com complaining about anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. Um, can we just go to the next slide, Daphne, please, to make the point here. Um, as I've said here, the use of violent language in relation to female politicians is nothing new. Uh, in fact, um, when Margaret Thatcher was the prime minister, um, there were certain um, sentiments expressed which were very violent towards her uh, when um, one of her cabinet members suggested she take her own noose to the, um, 19, the, the next 1922 committee of backbenchers. Um, but it seems that in the case of Jewish women, it's invariably coupled with misogynistic and sexually violent references to their Jewishness, um, as we saw in, the, in this second example and actually in the third example. Can you, sorry, can you go back again, Daphne, please, to the previous slide for the third point? Uh, also, these women, all three of them, um, complained about repeated rape threats accompanied by the terms Zionist bitch and Zionist C-U-N-T, the C word. Um, so we know that Zionist is anti-Semitic. Um, David Hirsch wrote a brilliant article which was published recently in the Journal of Contemporary Antisemitism about the use of the word Zionist and Zionism in anti-Semitic discourse. And we know that Zionist is used to refer to Jews as Nazis, as racists, as imperialists, and so on. Um, uh, as far as bitch and the C word are concerned, um, feminists have long argued that these words are used to reinforce the dehumanization of women by reducing them to uh, an animal, to a dog, or to a mere body part, in this case, the female genitalia. So again, we see um, a connection between the uh, misogynistic term and the anti-Semitic term and, and the violent rape threat. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? Um, thanks. So this, just this third point here, um, misogyny does consistently feature in politics. It's said to feature because of male resentment against women taking positions of political power. And actually, we've had a recent example uh, with the deputy leader of the Labour Party, Angela Rayner, who uh, only on Sunday in the Sunday, uh, the Mail on Sunday, um, uh, it was said in, 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 a, in an article in the Mail on Sunday that she crossed, an crossed her legs during a question and answer session uh, in Parliament in order to distract the Prime Minister um, and that it was kind of basic instinct sort of stuff. Um, and, and of course that is, you know, that's deeply misogynistic. Uh, but we see that in the case of Jewish women who hold political power, um, there is an added dimension relating to their Jewish ethnicity. Um, and to make the point again that was made at the SARA conference is that notions of power, control and domination are associated both with sexism and with anti-Semitism, and that Jewish women reside at the intersection of both of these. 
Uh, can we have the next slide, please, Daphne? Um, and just to say that in the case of Jewish female politicians, it wasn't just online abuse, gendered anti-Semitism they experienced. Here we have um, a handwritten, hand-delivered letter to Lucia, Luciana Berger's uh, constituency office when she was Labour MP in Liverpool. And we can see here the anti-Semitism, we can see the... Um, the misogyny. Um, and what's interesting also um, is uh, she actually said that re the receipt of this uh, particular letter, and there were others, made her feel physically ill. Um, what's interesting here is that because this letter was hand delivered, and because the people who wrote it said, see you later, yeah, but didn't identify themselves other than as Corbyn supporters. It, it was worse for her in many ways than the violence, the misogynistic abuse, gendered anti-Semitism that she experienced online, because here, um, not only these, did these people wish her harm, and obviously, hate her but they may have had the means to carry to carry out their threats and again i think what we need is some research to look at the impact of these kinds of threats on jewish women compared to online threats in order to get a sense of the range uh of this kind of abuse. And also to look at also secondary victims. We have primary victimization, uh, that is the victim, but we also have secondary victimization, the victim's family and the wider community. What did these, what did these examples of gendered anti-Semitism that became, that were discussed by these female politicians through the debate in parliament, what impact did that have? on other Jewish women in the UK. How did that, you know, and that is what we call secondary victimization. We, we, need, we do need to get some sociological and empirical data on these things. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please, Daphne? Um, all right, so now we're going to look very briefly at offline examples of gendered anti-Semitism in the UK. As I said, um, oh, so these 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 are all all happen to people in public spaces, uh, schoolgirls and grown women. We'll look at school school uh, schoolgirls first of all. Now, uh, this kind of uh, gendered anti-Semitism is not the product of political activism or ideology. It's usually associated with. Um, uh, you know, street patterns of street crime and antisocial behavior, and it's opportunistic. Um, so what happens is the uh, offender sees someone, a woman who's Jewish or who they, who's perceived to be Jewish. Um, they, they think she's Jewish because she's wearing a Jewish school uniform or a you know, Mac and Dovid or because it's a Jewish locality uh, and opportunistically, um, abuse them. So here, um, just there are just three examples of schoolgirls. There are, there are no data uh, by gender produced by any, any reports in this country. Um, so, the, so the Community Security Trust, the way to find these examples really is to go through all the reports and pick them out. Um, so we've just got three examples here of abuse targeting Jewish schoolgirls. They were wearing school uniforms uh, of Jewish schools. Uh, we see again the coupling of the word Jewish with the C word. Um, in all three, we've got the C word and the word Jewish, and uh, we, you know, it's, it's you know, sexually violent language as well. Um, it may it may surprise you that there are two, two of the offenders are female. This is actually not that common. According to uh, the CST's reports, only about 15% of offenders with respect to this kind of situation, um, only 15% are women. 
Um, but it shouldn't surprise us that uh, two out of the three offenders here were girls. Um, the word, the C word is, is, is used as a generic insult in popular youth culture. Uh, but also we mustn't forget that women and girls can also adopt misogynistic language. Um, can we have the next slide, please? Uh, okay, so this is abuse targeting Jewish women in public spaces. Again, this is pretty much opportunistic. These were women who were visibly Jewish because of their clothes or because of some star, a star of David, or were, supposed, or were assumed to be Jewish because of the locality. Um, again, we can see a very strong relationship between misogynistic words, um, uh, we've got the C word again uh, in three of these examples and the identity of the, the um, identity of the victim is Jewish. Um, what's interesting about the second example, uh, it's obvious that the anti-Semitism here is the Jew. Um, where's, where's the misogyny? Well, um, Arguably, that's the spit in the face, although spitting is also um, anti-Semitic. It shows contempt and could just be anti-Semitic. Uh, there's, uh, there's a researcher called Gumwerg from 1981 who said that the act of spitting, um, when it's performed by a man at a woman, is, is a phallic misogynistic act. Um, and what's interesting about number three um, is this was a non-Jewish woman on the London Underground and she objected to the perpetrator's racist comments. They were not racist comments about Jews. They were not anti-Semitic comments. They were racist comments about black people. And yet um, in his response to her, he associated her female status with Jewish status and disparage both. So what's interesting is um, this connection in the way people think between feminism or women and, and, and being Jewish. Uh, we need some more research into that. In fact, if you look on the Stormfront website, on 60% of the threads in which they talk about feminism, uh, Jews and Zionists are mentioned. Um, they, they refer to feminism as a Zionist conspiracy and a Jewish invention. There is this association between the two, which uh, is very interesting. And, and I think it would be good to look into it further. Um, so the, here is, yeah, some, some examples. And there, there are lots, there are, uh, a lot more. We see in, in example four, this was also involved a physical attack uh, where it would be a poured over the head of a Jewish woman and her friends um, because she bumped into someone in a pub, said sorry, and that was, that was the response. All right, can we move on to the next slide, please? Um, so just to analyze what we just looked at, um, Offline anti-Semitic abuse directed at women typically involves a male perpetrator. 85% uh, on average uh, of perpetrators are male. Uh, the female victim experiences misogynistic abuse alongside anti-Semitism. And if we think about the kind of uh, abuse that Jewish men experience in public spaces, um, it takes the form predominantly of physical attacks uh, or occurs in the context of football matches uh, with words like yid and dirty Jew. Th those, ten those words tend to be used, there are others as well. But what's interesting is there are no recorded incidences of the use of gendered abusive terms like the C word or sexually violent language like rape involving male victims. So again, it would be very useful, I think, to do some research uh, on, on the nature of 
abuse that's directed at Jewish men vis-a-vis -vis Jewish women and on the impact, on its impact. Uh, some comparison would be, would be interesting. Um, and we can see that Jewish women's and Jewish girls' experiences of anti-Semitic anti abuse appear to be shaped by their female identity. Uh, and then just the next slide, uh, Daphne, I think that's the concluding slide, thank you. So, so there is very little empirical or sociological data on the topic of gendered anti-Semitism uh, in, uh, you know, in the UK and, and probably elsewhere. Um, and what I tried to do in my chapter was to get the um, socio social empirical ball rolling uh, to try to find what evidence of gendered anti-Semitism we do have and to suggest where uh, further research would and why further research would prove fruitful. Limited though the evidence of gendered anti-Semitism in the UK is, it's sufficiently indicative to suggest that the expression of sexual violence against women becomes far worse when an element of conscious anti-Semitism enters it, as David Hirsch observed in 2019. We need further research on the intersection of anti-Semitism and misogyny uh, to provide empirically supported data on the nature, function and impact of gendered anti-Semitism, and to consider both the primary victimization and the secondary victimization. Uh, and it's hoped uh, that once this data becomes available, it will only be a matter of time before the law recognizes that anti-Semitism is an aggravating factor in misogynistic hate, hate crime. And I think that's really where we need to focus our energies to, um, to uh, have uh, the law, um, criminal justice agencies, the police, recognize uh, gendered anti-Semitism as an aggravating uh, factor, as a subcategory of misogynistic hate crime. All right, well, thanks very much. Um, I think that's just over 30 minutes and um, be very happy to take any questions or comments. So Leslie, I'll say that you're, thank you so much for a very interesting lecture and one that's desperately needed to address the problems that too many people feel reluctant to discuss. It's generated a series of comments in the chat about the ways in which um, most of your references didn't just come from, from anyone, they came from Labor Party members, none of whom were publicly rebuked by Corbyn himself and um, some even suggested um, or, or made reference to the ways in which the notion that Jewish women were, quote, paid by Israel was somehow not anti-Semitic. So perhaps you can address that. And then there's one additional question that came in that re that's from Harvey Garfield that reads, I'm particularly interested in how we can take this beyond an academic study to robust coordinated legal challenges across a broad spectrum of intersectionality, but especially in reference to Black Lives Matter, LGBT movements, campus anti-Semitism. Um, so I was hoping that you could address those two. Yeah, sure. So the first question, um, yeah, I, think, I think a lot of those uh, social media attacks on Jewish Labour Party parliamentarians were probably um, were actually anonymous uh, in the sense that they the abusers identified themselves as Labour Party supporters or Corbyn supporters and so on. And of course, this is the problem with uh, with social media is that it uh, it not only allows for an economy of scale with respect to uh, abuse but it also allows for anonymity of course had their identity been known I'm sure that um, Jeremy Corbyn wouldn't have uh, taken any action against them um, there are examples of far-right gendered anti-semitism as well if you look at the stormfront website there are plenty of there were there are plenty of references there to um, Luciana Berger as an equine-faced 
uh, equine, equine face Zionist and, and just, you know, vile, vile comments like that. And in fact, um, Jewish women politicians are mentioned far more in an abusive way on the Stormfront website than are Jewish male politicians. And I think this goes again to what was said at the SARA conference is that women, Jewish women, reside at the intersection of sexism and anti-Semitism, both of which um, are associated with notions of control, power and domination. And of course, that is exaggerated either, even further in women who hold, hold political power. And that is something that the, the far right doesn't like either, as well as, as, well as the hard left. Um, so yeah, what's, what was anti-Semitic about that? Well, um, to my mind, the anti-Semitism lay in the idea that these women were, were paid for by Israel. Um, that Israel was the, uh, the hand of Israel was seen as being behind the um, allegations of anti-Semitism in the Labour Party is manufacturing, manufacturing these allegations for some reason to smear Corbyn or to prevent him from becoming uh, uh, prime minister. But also um, in, in hard left thinking, um, Israel is, is considered to be the great whore master of the world. And, and in that sense, um, you know, it, it's, it's, I think there is, it, it's very conspiratorial in, in a way that you've got these Jewish women who don't have any agency themselves, but, you know, they're in the pocket of, of this paymaster, Israel, who's pulling the strings in the background. And I think um, that is, uh, that, that does relate, that's sort of conspiratorial and and uh, associating Israel with, with things that are bad, uh, with manipulation, and it, you know, it's political anti-Semitism. Um, the other question was that, uh, was that how we, oh, from Harry, from Mr. Garfield about how we can mobilize, uh, well, I, I, you know, the, the law and so on. I think what we need to do is, that's very, I mean, this question, very good question, as was the last one. I think what we need to do is we do need some research on gendered anti-Semitism and we need to make it available, not only for the public, we need to produce it in a way that's understandable to the lay reader but we also need to use it to produce a report for criminal justice agencies and even, even for, the, for the government. We need to, um, uh, I, so for example, uh, Amy mentioned at the beginning that I'm involved in a research project looking, uh, we've not started it yet, but we're, we're getting funded, we're waiting for the funding to come through, but um, we will be looking at gendered, anti-Semitism online and gendered Islamophobia online. And one of the outcomes of this research project, which we plan is to write a report, not only for criminal justice agencies, but for, uh, there is a new online safety bill that's going through parliament, um, that's going to create the office of online regulator, uh, and it's going to place a legal uh, duty on social media platforms to regulate the hate speech on their platform in accordance with UK law. This is just UK legislation. And one of the things we plan to do with our research is write a report for the regulator to, so that whoever that person is, they haven't been appointed yet, the bill has to be passed first as an act of parliament uh, so that that person is aware of, you know, some researched empirical data on gendered anti-Semitism and gendered Islamophobia, um, because it is a social problem, as we've said, it's not just a problem that impacts on the victim herself, there are secondary victims. There, there are, uh, and 
um, a lot a lot of this hate speech actually makes people ill and then they take you know they have to take time off work they can't be good parents it has a huge impact on society as well but that's that's the only way is to get the data to go to a select committee in parliament to to uh to go to you know to and to try and uh, make these reports such that members of parliament are interested in them and that's really the way forward so leslie we've got several more questions i i first call on barry shaw who's been waiting for barry you'll have to unmute yes okay can you hear me yeah okay good um i take a historic perspective um and I go backwards and see where uh, the misogyny, anti-Semitism, particularly targeting uh, women can lead because uh, I go from perspective that I've written about in books and articles and spoken about that if you go back a century, for instance, to the Nebi Musa riots and the Hebron massacre perpetrated by the incitement of uh, Haj Amin al Husseini, in which he took a Muslim festival, the Nebi Musa, to encourage the Arabs to riot in the old city of uh, Jerusalem and uh, kill the Jews and steal their property. Part of that stealing and killing was, of course, the rape of women in the uh, Jewish women. Uh, and this was carried on a couple of years later in the Hebron massacre, where again the Arabs were incited to take the uh, kill the Jews and take their property. They included raping the women because in the Arab mind, you know, the women belonging to uh, Jewish husbands are seen as, a, as property of the men and therefore, you know, uh, suitable to be taken. Now, um, I, my point has always been that if uh, anti-Semitism is left to go unbridled and unchallenged, uh, the perpetrators will become more emboldened, not just to insult mm. the Jewish women but actually mm. take similar actions against uh, Jewish women. Mm. And we've mm. begun to see signs of this already in certain mm. incidents in France. So yeah. it doesn't yeah. stop with verbal abuse. No, exactly. That's a very good point. And in fact, there has been uh, some research. Um, the, there was a report produced as recently as 2019 by the Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination against women, which showed a causal connection between misogynistic attitudes and vi the violent and targeting of women in a violent way, the criminal targeting of women. So gender-based violence, uh, there, it, there does seem to be a causal connection between that and the misogynistic attitudes. So that's a very good point. It, it is, I mean, uh, it, it, you know, it is it, it is very important to recognise that these are not just harmless words or thoughts, but they can have real tangible impact. Can I can I emphasise this, uh, uh, Leslie? Because only today I wrote an article which I've sent round to a number of Jewish papers around the world. Uh, just a few days ago, there was an attack in New York uh, City on a, a Jewish man who attended a uh, counter rally there against a Palestinian uh, demonstration, uh, calling for an end to Israel. And uh, he got he got attacked, um, uh, and he was uh, sent to hospital with the concussion. Uh, and the reason I say this is because the violence is already beginning. Because the mm. people who march through the street wanting to see an end of Israel always target the local Jew. And they, if they can't kill an Israeli over yeah. here in Israel or a Jew over yeah. here in Israel, they was, they are already starting to attack the Jews on the streets of London and other places right. as well. And yeah. this will not restrict itself, I suggest, to men. Uh, and unless the yeah. authorities and unless the Jewish organizations in Britain, including the Board of Takers, take a more affirmative step on this, mm. I'm afraid uh, they will only come into action when, unfortunately, grave issues are taken, not just against men, but against Jewish women in, on the streets of London, Manchester and other places. Thanks, yes. Barry. Can you can you drop you. that? I, I see that you're active on the chat. Could you drop a link to that if possible so other people might have access to it? And then, um, then Leslie, we have uh, a question from 
Sasha Simon that reads, wonderful talk, Dr. Claff, thank you. Do you think that an interdisciplinary effort would be beneficial to this issue? For example, philosophy, critical media experts, sociologists, political theorists, and so forth. It seems that anti-Semitism and specifically gendered anti-Semitism can be addressed by multiple vantage points. Mm. Uh, yes, absolutely. That's an excellent point. Um, the research that I'm about to start on with five or six other women from other universities is uh, multidisciplinary, cross-disciplinary. We have I'm there's me and um, two other two other women who uh, law academics, but we have a couple. We have a sociologist, a criminologist, a psychologist. Uh, a feminist sociologist and so on. It, and it is, it's very important to look at uh, the nature of this harm from a range of perspectives. That's exactly right. It's very important to do that. So we're very much looking forward to that study when, once you get it off the ground. Um, I'm wondering if it might be that anti-Semitism has an opportunity to further flourish in an environment that actually labor notwithstanding um, seems to downplay issues of class. And to what extent do we see that in terms of the JAP allegation? You know, it seems very, when we're talking about materialism, it seems tied to mm. class. Nobody wants to really address mm. class issues anymore. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are. Um, well, the I think the JAP stereotype uh, does have, does have a class element in it. I mean, if we look at if we look at the um, if we look at the way Jewish American princesses were portrayed in literature and in um, sitcoms and in in movies, um, they were the daughters of Jewish people who had were upward, up, had, who had become upwardly mobile in the United States very quickly, uh, who spoiled their daughters and who um, their, their aim for their daughter was to marry well. And that was the, that was the aim of the individual uh, girl uh, or woman, uh, was to marry, you know, a Jewish doctor or Jewish lawyer and, 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 and this kind of thing. So it was very aspirational and it was very much tied in, I think, with class. I think the portrayal of Jewish American princesses was one in which they, um, you know, they were portrayed as money grubbing and as, and as materialistic, but there, there wasn't a shortage. There wasn't a shortage of money. So there was a class element. And certainly with, with the theory of intersectionality um, and the idea that people experience multiple victimizations depending on their identity status, their various minority identities, there, there is certainly a class element involved in that as well. Um, there is, there is no, I mean, if you were to do some research uh, and produce a taxonomy of hate, the, uh, and if you were to speak to women who've experienced intersectional abuse, uh, many of them, I'm sure, would identify class, socioeconomic status, uh, as an element in the abuse that they experienced. And, and we've got one last question from Jennifer Badini. What about talking about, this is a huge one, what about talking about the ideology of Nazism in the Middle East, not the Gulf countries, as they, took, as they look as if we're subhuman? During World War II, many of the intellectuals in the Middle East admired Hitler and Nazism. Yeah, so sorry, what's the, what's the question? Looking at that as, as... What about talking about the ideology of Nazism that is present in the Middle East, especially given that during World War II, many of the intellectuals there admired Hitler and Nazism. To what extent does that help foster the kind of misogyny that, uh, that's anti-Semitic that you're talking about today? Well, it, yeah, it may, it may, that's a very good point. It may be very relevant. I mean, the, um, a, a lot of the abuse that, uh, a lot of the published abuse that um, Luciana Berger was on the, re uh, received, and we saw in that hand handwritten, hand-delivered letter, um, she was referred to as a stinking Jew. Now that, that was a very popular 
a uh, very, very popular stereotype of Jews that uh, during the Nazi period. And um, uh, to the extent that those stereotypes were exported to the Middle East and so on, um, I think all of the all of this is relevant um, in order to really understand gendered anti-Semitism. We have to have a full understanding of anti-Semitism uh, and we have to understand um, it at the contemporary level and more traditional uh, level. We know that anti-Semitism is often buried in discourse um, and it's not easy to recognize. It's not as obvious as other racisms. And in the chapter I wrote in that book, it actually starts off with a whole section on understanding anti-Semitism. Um, of course, for an ice gap audience, that's not something we need to discuss because we all we all know about anti-Semitism. We've all ex most of us have experienced it, if not all of us, and we understand it. We can recognize it. But the more information we can gather, uh, you know, for the data that we produce on anti-Semitism in terms of its Nazi, uh, the Nazi, um, the Nazi era, era and its existence in other parts of the world, um, is yes, it's it is it is something that's worth doing. And once once reports are produced uh, in this country. Uh, that may have some impact on the government or on parliament or on criminal justice agencies, um, you know, they can be shared or modified or adopted by other countries. It's just that we need, we need to start somewhere. Um, and one of the things we're, talk we're talking about, the group of women I'm researching with, uh, is whether to um, do something for the, for the European Commission, for example, um, and, and yes, it, it, is, it is all relevant. Thank you for that. Well, thank you so much for being with us today, Professor Claff, and uh, may you have the best of luck and may your research be widely disseminated. Um, thank you everyone for those of you who signed on for your contributions, your um, work, uh, Professor Shaw for his work and his comment about how this is historical. Um, thank you all, and um, may we be effective in, in this um, onslaught of anti-Semitism. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.